Hi, I am Stephanie from Co-op, K-O-O-P 91.7 FM, and I am joined today by Ben Queller. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm good. (laughs) Good to meet you. You too. Thank you for agreeing to to chat with me. Of course. Um, So the very, very, very first thing I want to get out of the way is we, like, we did see some of your set and the video of your grandma. Oh my gosh. I love her. She is She's the amazing. best. And I wanted to see if you could tell me a little bit about her. Yeah, so her name was Marilyn Queller. And she was quite a woman. Um, always the life of the party. Loved to dance. Loved to sing. I feel like I got a lot of my talent from her. My, my song and dance. Oh yeah. She was always just a happy person. And I remember when I made my third album, it was called Ben Queller, it was self-titled, I played all the instruments. I sent her a CD of it before it came out, because I would always do that. I would send her my music, like, hey, Bubby, we called her Bubby. Hey, Bubby, here's my new album, I hope you like it. And I remember she called me up after I sent her the third album, and she said, Benjamin, I love your new album, and I love that Penny on the Train Track song. I just go around my apartment, and I just dance and I sing Penny on the Train Track. And I was like, oh my God, Bobby, that's incredible. And I was telling my record label, I said, so yeah, my grandmother's favorite, because we were talking about singles, like which, what are we going to send to radio, you know? And we were talking about Penny on the Train Track and some other ones. And I said, well, you know, my grandmother thinks Penny is the one. And she actually dances around her apartment to it. And they're like, bro. We're giving you a camera and sending you down to Florida so you can video that. Oh my God. And so that became the Penny on the track, Train Track video of her dancing in her like little workout room in her apartment complex. And so, yeah, that video is a special video. Um, she's no longer with us, but yeah, I mean, what an inspiration. I heard we need to crop the video, though, for that screen. It didn't quite get cropped because I heard, like, her top half was cut off. So it was just all, it was, like, all grandma hips and stuff. A little inappropriate. But I'm like, give it up for my grandma. She's, like, shaking her booty. It was it was the best. I was just standing out there just like, oh, my God, I love her so much. She's she's a legend, yeah. Yeah. Um, So you have played ACL, like, 40 million times yeah um <laughs> how has it changed um since you first because i think your first year was like 2003 yeah that something? sounds right yeah which i think was like maybe the second second, or year. second year yeah yeah the rem headlined oh my gosh. bright eyes that's i met connor oberst actually there made a lot of friends that year down here um i was on my second album and i was on tour supporting that album that one was called on my way and a little band called Kings of Leon were opening up for me. They had just started playing and like they could barely play their instruments, but they were like learning on tour. But you could just tell they were so good, you know, like the songs were amazing. Caleb's voice was incredible. And yeah, that was a real magical time, early 2000s. Yeah, that's awesome. How how has it changed um, both like, how has the festival grown? How have you noticed it? And then how have you as a musician Hmm. changed in, in the last 20 years yeah um well the festival has definitely grown it back in those days it was still kind of in in its infancy um you know some might say it had more of a homey kind of small town feel to it maybe that's true because it was just kind of a new it was like the new kid on the block when the festivals were kind of all started like all the ones we know today like Bonnaroo Coachella you know Lala and everything um but It somehow, to me, as a music fan, it's retained a lot of that hometown charm, which is very Austin. And it's one of my favorite festivals to play at as an artist. Um, You know, a lot of family vibes because I go way back with Charles Atal and Charlie Walker and uh, the guys that, you know, started this thing. Mm -hmm. So there's always some nostalgia attached to performing here. And obviously I have some historic moments here especially the nosebleed incident. I heard about that yeah um (laughs) I I'm very lucky I don't have a job like you where I have to just bleed out on stage oh yeah you gotta bleed for the people (laughs) I'm here for you (laughs) blood and all you literally put your blood sweat and tears into it exactly (laughs) um so I I wanted to ask because um you know I we saw your set. I noticed uh, when we came into, 
um, you have somehow managed to uh, have a band that includes Christopher Mintz Posse. Yeah. <laughs> um, how do you choose, you know, who you're going to work with, who's going to go into your band? And do you, yeah. you know, just like, for instance, because I feel like you come from very different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, how do you link up with people? And well, so the life of the musician is you're around musicians a lot. And um, being that I'm a solo artist, so I, I come from bands. That's my history. In the 90s, when I started out, I had a band called Radish, which was my first like real professional band. We got a record deal. I was 15 years old, dropped out of high school, went on tour, never looked back. And when I was 18, I just started writing more autobiographical music because like when you're the front man of, of a band and you're the songwriter, you know, you're kind of representing everybody in the band and there's kind of a feeling of that. But the songs I started writing when I was 18 were like really deeply personal. And I, at the same time, I also moved to New York City and I didn't really have any friends yet in New York. And so I was writing these songs. I recorded them in my apartment and I looked around the room and no one was there. And so I said, I guess I'll be Ben Queller, you know? Uh -huh. And so that's when I went solo. So being a solo artist is kind of interesting. Um, I mean, you have creative control, which is a positive, but also a lot of times you can kind of just be out in the cold all alone, you know, because it's all on your shoulders. But I was willing to kind of take that, you know, the trade off of like the risk, but also the reward of just being able to really sing my heart out and like, wear it on my sleeve you know yes um and so uh the first two albums i had a solid band but you know then people will change and people do different projects and also the music develops and changes and um for that third album with penny on the train track i played all the instruments on the album but i almost went too far and i like added too much stuff and so then when it was time to go on tour i needed like a five-piece band to pull it off it was like on some like E Street Band level, where it was like, I needed an organ player and a piano player and another guitar player and me playing guitar. And, you know, and so we put together a big band. So there's a lot of fun freedom in that and just putting together a band and playing with all different people. And then you meet friends on the road. And over the years, I've just sort of realized that it's really important for me to be surrounded by positivity and, and people that really just are all in the same mission in life. And there was this great band called Main Man out of Los Angeles who opened for me on a tour back in 2018, I think, uh, pre-pandemic. And Chris was the bass player. Ryan was the drummer. And we just became really good friends. And, so, and then the pandemic hit and touring ended for a while. And when it was time to get back on the road, I called those guys up and I was like, you're amazing. You're great musicians. You're amazing humans. Let's play together. And so Chris is out here. And I, I think of him, everyone, you know, just walking through a festival crowd with him is kind of insane because everyone's like, Mick Lovin, oh my God, it's insane. But for me, I think of him as a bass player first. Right. You know, like he really is an incredibly talented musician. And uh, so I, I feel lucky just really to have these musicians with me. And, but above all, and as my grandma used to say about me, you're a good person. And that's really more than, you can be the best ripper on guitar or bass or whatever, but if you're, if you're not fun to be around, I don't care how good you are, you yeah. know? So like, it's really about the people first. I always tell young bands, it's the 23 hours you're not on stage that count the most. I love that. No, that's, that's so, so important because I've heard stories from people who, yeah, they're, they're going to want to go after the best or, or you know, oh. what have you, but they're not always good yeah people. yeah you gotta define what what is the best to you and yeah. to me it's like obviously you have to be a good musician to right, play my stuff clearly. like it's kind of it's it's simple rock and roll but there is like complications to it that make mm -hmm. it a little more difficult so you got to be at a certain level but like you don't have to be the best yeah. musically you know? do you do you write your music like I guess a little more complicated on purpose or is that just kind no, of how you it's just I really try to go stream of consciousness and actually I, try, I simplify stuff a lot you know it's it's like a it's a little uh dance of like complexity the most important thing is just to like convey convey emotion 
through the music. Yeah. For me, that's what I'm trying to do. Because it's like therapy for me. It's my, I never, I've always wanted to keep a diary or a journal and I've never been able to do it because I'm not disciplined enough. So my songs are that, you know, my, they're the, my diary pages. Yeah, no, I think that that's a lot better. I, I mean, it, it works for me. Yeah, no, I love it. Um, I guess the last question I really have, um, because you have been writing music for so long and, and you just said it is like your diary. Is there, are there any songs that you wrote as a youngin that mm. really still speak to you and still kind yeah. of define you? It's funny because like for a long time, it was hard for me to listen back to the Radish recordings they were so cringy you know every anything you do i mean our first recordings were when i was like 12 years old yeah i was a baby you know and it was kind of cringy in the lyrics you know i was just getting my sea legs as a writer but i'm now at a point where i put it on i'm like damn like that's pretty good you know yeah um and so that that's i'm happy about that um there are songs that i still play today that i I, I'm kind of surprised that I wrote when I was like, there's one called In Other Words, it's a piano ballad. And I wrote that when I was 16 years old. And uh, it's, I think, a really good song. Yeah. Awesome. That's one in particular. Wasted and Ready I wrote when I was young, but I wouldn't say that that, even though that's a hit, like, it's not my favorite song. It's a little gimmicky, like looking back, you know, the lyrics are pretty funny, but. Um, but also I love it because it, it was who I was then and, you know, it speaks to me still. But in other words, from like a pure songwriting level, like I'm impressed by that one. Like the old Ben Queller says to the young Ben Queller, like, oh, okay, that was really good. You yeah. know, good job, dude. So. Awesome. Well, that's, it. that's all I've got. Well, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you, co-op.